Yeah, we released it. It was me and um, Junior Sanchez, okay. a popular DJ. Put out a um, uh, house record. So you can pretty much produce, create any genre music? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. How long have you been producing records? 93? Yeah, since 93. You got a very interesting story, Bryce. Um, I appreciate you for have, uh, coming upon my platform. This Definitely. is Gully TV. Uh, this is a long time coming. Um, first thing i like to ask you is give me the history on this legendary group you were a part of briefly. Um, Groove Theory. First off, I would like to know who chose the name Groove Theory. Uh, I chose the name um, because I did, a, I did a group called Mantronics. So I kind of just played off of the same thing, you know, that was more human, electronic. So I kind of played off the same thing with Groove Theory. Um, wanted to make something that was like more genuine and authentic grooves and then theory, something that's more calculating, you know. Okay. Um, how was the group? How did y'all go, go about being put together? Um, I had, I came, I came into music maybe 90, 91, when I did Mantronics. Okay. And then after that, I had like maybe a year or two off. And I, I thought about it, and I was looking at the dude I was signed to who was a producer, and I was like, I want to be him. So I went and bought some equipment, sat in the crib for like a year by myself, and taught myself how to produce. And um, I had got a publishing deal in the meantime. When I got the publishing deal, the company was like, yo, we keep giving you this bread every four months, but we don't really understand the music you're doing. All right. So my publisher um, at the time was this, this uh, lady, Karen Durant. She gave me the opportunity. So Karen said, check out my um, assistant, Amel. Okay. So I was like, yeah, fuck it, I ain't got nothing else to lose. So Amel came out to my crib in Jersey. I put it in the bathroom. She sung to a beat I made. And it was just, it was just crazy. It was just like, it was like magical. All right. So after that, went back to the company, with a couple of records, and it seemed like whatever she wrote to it started to make my tracks make sense. Like my tracks made sense to me. Right. But I guess to them listening to that versus what was on the radio, it wasn't really making sense to them. So once they heard her putting the melody and the vocals on it. Then all of a sudden everything became, you know, it, it kind of congealed together and started to make sense. When you say congealed, how long did it take for you guys to create the chemistry necessary to create a song that's so timeless as Tell Me? Five minutes. About five minutes all together. Like, five minutes? Yeah. That quick? Yeah. After meeting her and just like yeah. blending for a minute? Yeah, because everything with, like with me, I, pl I, I play. If I'm, if I'm just fucking around with music, making a beat, that's how I come across a hit record. I can't think about, oh, I want to do this. I can't calculate it that far. Because every time I've tried to do that, it's never turned out right. So that's kind of how Mel is the type where whatever I would give her, she would just kill it. Because she grew up on so many. Me, I could hear something, be influenced by it. And you know, you just keep all these colors in your head. So you just call them down, you make your music with her. She had... A better relationship with different genres of music so if I touched on this genre and this genre and put it together she could address it from a very authentic place because she grew up on Jimi Hendrix the Beatles she grew up on a lot of stuff that I didn't grow up on okay you know so that's what that's what made a lot of it work what um, what session led to the record tell me and upon recording it did you know that this record was gonna be special was it something um, about it that made it what it ended up being and shit is third probably 25 30 years later and i nah. still hear it yeah no we had no idea we so um jimmy henchman had a group jimmy henchman and peter thomas had a group they had a company together they had a group called rhythm and bass um which have they've now moved on to being huge songwriters um, vocal coaches for the voice out in london a bunch of stuff but they were a london-based group the, a guy group so i was working with them and a mel wrote tell me so we we did that record for them 
they were signed to Epic. They put the record out, and the record didn't perform. Okay. So when me it was and put Mel, out in the in the states, in the UK. Oh, in the UK. Yeah, and it didn't didn't chart or anything. Um, so when we finished the album, we sit in the studio, and Paris Davis, who signed us to Epic, he said we need one more song. So we didn't have no more songs. So I was like, let's just do. Tell me. So she was like, all right. And then uh, I went and changed the beat completely different from how we did rhythm and bass. Mm -hmm. Did that. I had an idea of what I wanted it to be. And then my guy, Dow Brown, who did a lot of my keyboards, guitar, whatever, he plays everything, um, hummed out the bass line to him. And then he played the bass line, and then we kept going. And then, you know, she went and did the vocals in 10 minutes, and, and that was it. So it was the last record on the album. Y'all went and did some Ashford and Simpson shit <laughs> in the clutch, yeah. like yeah, last minute. Yeah, but I heard a lot of groups like had had story, similar stories where it was that you know it was the last idea they had or whatever, and that was the one that took off. Right. Yeah, but that was definitely that was against our whole mission. Our whole mission wasn't a, wasn't about being on the radio. Our mission, my mission as a producer was, I wanted to kill New Jack Swing. Okay. Even though, you know. Teddy did the, you know, Teddy's one of the most amazing producers that ever lived, um, and he's a genius. I'm competitively based. So for me, if this is what's on the radio, I need to kill what's on the radio. So that's why I went in that direction instead of going with, you know, what the radio sounded like. And, you know, and it just, it just worked. Explain to me how that record was able to, for some reason that record, it, it was able to fit in a hip hop rotation. Even though it was an R&B record, yeah, you can hear it right behind a, a Herb McGruff or a, who all was out that summer, Nas. And mm -hmm. hip hop was the resurgence of hip hop actually was going on in '95. Yeah, and Tell Me was a record that would stand right in there with the hip hop crowd and shit. Like, yeah. not only do guys, I mean, girls like the record, mm -hmm. guys like the record too. Yeah, it was. I mean, that record. Yeah, I was in New York at the time, and that was that was a New York, New York record right there. It was a record that just um, Chuck Chill out all of them DJs back then. As soon as they clocked Kent, all them DJs once they heard it, that record just kind of had wings of its own, of its own. Like it did. It, yeah, it went out and it was just like, you know, you know, like a, the label was like, oh yeah, this DJ playing, this DJ playing it, and then I'll go out to a club. And I see like cars passing by a plane, and I'm like, yo, what the fuck is going on? Right. And it was just weird. And then you know, and then once it hit the radio, it was it was just gone after that, you know. But I think that's that's what Groove Theory was. It was like I wanted to have the nigga bop, and then I wanted to offset that with something soft, you know what I'm saying? Which is her vo her voice and and her melodies. And I think that that record was just the the perfect balance of that. Right. You mentioned Jimmy Henchman earlier, and um during the course of your story. Tell me how you met Jimmy Henchman. I met Jimmy through um, Paris Davis, who was our A&R over at, uh, at Epic. Paris is uh, super visionary, smart dude. Um, he was doing a lot of things people are doing now. He was doing way back then. So Paris introduced me to Jimmy. I was like, yo, you got to meet my man. He's a manager and he got a, you know, he got a group, whatever. And I was like, all right, cool, whatever. And, you know, met Jimmy. Um, little unassuming dude, and um, we just clicked immediately. You know, we just we clicked immediately, and we got to work immediately. We kept making these records for his group, and while that was happening, there were a lot of instances going on during the recording that me and Jimmy were doing a lot of problem solving with, and um, we just really we just really gelled, you know, personality wise. I just I really liked his vibe. He was super honest. Um, Wanted to get the work done, and didn't didn't spare. It was at, at all costs, like whatever right. it costs to do it. This studio is booked out. Let's find another studio. Let's just go. So I really I really liked his energy, um, and what he was about, and um, and then we just we just continued from there. You know, we continued to start forming companies together, and you know, became business partners. Okay, Groove Groove Theory and the song uh, the record Tell Me came out in '95. The Quad Studio shooting happened November 20th, 1994. Did you have a relationship with him in 94? Mm-hmm. With Jimmy in 94? Yep. Where were you at 
during the, the era when the whole quad studio. I was at the studio that day. You were there the night that that happened? Yeah, because I was producing the song with Sean and Pac. So I was at the studio the night that, that it went down. Do you care to discuss any any of it? Some people, it's, it's a sensitive topic. I promise to keep it professional. You got to let me run just two or three questions while you uh, just, yeah, let's keep run it the clean. Couple. Yeah, All right. um, yeah what, do you, what do you remember most about that night? Um, the most things I remember about that night was, um, you know, I came down, I came down in the, in the uh, lobby. I seen blood on the wall. I looked over. I seen Pac and his man got in the elevator. I went up with him. Um, it just went haywire after that because once we got up the elevator, he immediately started, um, you know, accusing Jimmy. I think Puff was there. Andre Harrell was there. A bunch of people. He immediately started accusing Jimmy. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy was like, you know, what are you talking about? Like, let's get your ambulance. Like, sit down. You okay? And he was, you know, Pac was, I knew him before then. So Pac was just, just, he's a fiery dude, you know. So he was relentless in, you know, telling Jimmy, you know, he set him up. He has something to do with it. So, you know, I remember that. Um, and I remember, you know, Stretcher took Fred out to the street to get an ambulance. And he came back in. Stretch was pissed when he came up. Um, I remember Pac's man was... You know, he he was he was worried. He was really worried about Pac, and Pac kind of switched into that other personality. And then all of a sudden, he wanted he wanted an ambulance, and you know, he wanted help. And then um, after that, I had looked and I saw the burn hole on Pac, so I, I knew that he, you know, he must have had a pistol on himself, and it went off. And after that, we uh, you know, we decided to leave. You know. It just it was just it was just nonstop chaos. So we decided to leave. Went downstairs in the hallway. We went down the hallway. The cops was already down there. Put us up on the wall. And Biggie and and C's and all of them came downstairs. About 20 of us on the wall. And then um, you know we got searched. Then they brought Pac out and the stretcher. He looked at everybody. Everybody looked at him. And then um, when we left, we walked out the, the front door. Went to the right down the block, cross the street, and went behind the news cameras and left. And I think a mistake was Biggie and all of them kind of just went straight out at the, at the news cameras. And I think that added to the tension by them kind of being, you know. The way it was depicted? Yeah, yeah. I think that, you know, them just coming straight out the building like that, they kind of put themselves on blast. And then, you know, from there, everything just did what it did from there. Prior to that whole incident, what type of person was Tupac in your opinion? Did you get to like kick it with him? I mean, he was being managed by Jimmy Jimmy Henchman at the time or something of that nature. Or he No, no, no. He was he was um I, first time I met Pac was in London. Um when I had I had a I was about to have a fight at the Wembley with a bunch of Def Jam artists. It was Russell Simmons that said something to me. And um you know, it was it was me against like 20, 30 dudes. They just kept coming out of the out of the green rooms. I was just there by myself, so it was what it was. So I just kind of got low and squared up, and then this dude got next to me was like, "I got you," and I was like, "I'm good." And the more I moved forward, he moved forward with me, and I looked. I was like, "Oh, this, this dude from Digital Underground." <laughs> and um, nothing ever popped off because um, my man Godfather from Booyah Tribe came and, and stopped it, but. That's how me and Pac got got our relationship. Okay. That's how me and him became friends. And then from there, um, me and my man um, Malik from Queens, I used to bring him out to see Pac, and we'd always go out to see Pac, and you know they they rhyme together, hang out, do whatever. Then when I would start going back on the road, um, Malik, was Barry, same person, he would go out and check on Pac. You right. know, if I was out the country, if I was out of town, whatever. And then we was always cool. And then. You know, a couple of years later, I seen him, and then he had the the, the Thug Life tattoos on, and and he was he was a, he was a different person. Right. Know? So our friendship changed from there. That was the second time 
during the course of this interview that you said different person or he had a different personality. He, he should. Yeah. Some pe some people have described him as having two people existed inside of him. One which is righteous and you know might mean yeah. well as far as furthering the cause of black people. And then mm -hmm. you have another guy who was he gravitated towards street shit. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I think I think the lore of the street. A lot of people get caught up in that, and especially when you hit the, the spotlight, you're around it. You know, you can you can those relationships come out of there. You know, right. but I think that um, yeah, Pac was definitely he was he was two different people. You 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 didn't know which Pac you you would get. Right. You know what I'm saying? Between today and tomorrow, you can get it. You can get a completely different person. But he was very fiery. Had a lot of energy. He was he wasn't street dude at all. He was a, a revolutionary one thousand percent. Right. If it was for the cause, then he was 100%. But he wasn't, when I say he wasn't a street dude, he wasn't, meaning he wasn't street wise. Okay. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't street wise, so he didn't understand how to navigate that side. Got you. You know what I'm saying? He was just a very, a good articulator, very powerful, um, strong, revolutionary minded dude. Right. Yeah, that was more of his thing. Where were you at when he started bombing on Jimmy with the records and all that? Uh, I mean, against all odds, where were you at when was, when the, the Machiavelli album? Where were you at when that came? I was around making records, um, kind of just scratching my head the whole time. Like, I don't, you know, it just seemed like he was kind of being a pit bull. Like, he, he had a, 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 a bone to chew on and just wouldn't let it go. You know? Okay. Um, I think that... Not, I think, you know, Pac had, I think because of what happened in that studio, I think it was a little embarrassing to him, and I think that the easy way out was to have these scapegoats, you know, it's Puff, it's Biggie, and, you know, it's all of that stuff, and then, right. you know, his alignment with Suge after that, it's like, you're angry, you're mad, but at the same time, you're kind of aligning yourself with protection, Yeah, you know what I mean, at the same time, so I think he was just um, heavily conflicted, I would say. You said um, that he immediately, when it happened, he got off the elevator, he immediately implicated Jimmy. Yeah. When the records, by the time the record came out, hit him up, he was in, implicating four or five different people. Uh, Tut's yeah. name was mentioned. Haitian Jack's name was mentioned. Yeah. Uh, I think Little Sean's name was mentioned. It just, mm -hmm. was that puzzling that it went from being... The Jimmy situation too. I'm banging on the whole East Coast. I think that no, nah, I mean you know everybody everybody knew each other. Right. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like he was talking about this crew from here and this crew from you know 50 miles away. Everybody everybody was you know we, we all rocked with each other. So you know I think that I mean you know Jack changed the way he dressed. You know Jack gave him a different style. You know what I mean? Jack. Changed the way he dressed, changed the way he talked a little. So you around that whole yeah. period of time when he was running with Jack and oh yeah, you seen him when you seen his dress go change from being dressed a certain way to yeah. go to the Versace thing. Yeah, yeah. When I saw him, there was a a club we used to go to called Chaz and Wilson. So I, I pulled up one day and I and I was walking and I looked to my left. I seen Ricky, Jack, and Pac sitting in between him. Jack was like, yo, you know, what up? Gave me a glass of champagne. He was like, you know, Pac? I was like, yeah, I know. And I was confused then, too. Like, how did Pac <laughs> meet them? <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? Like, how did he meet them? And why is he dressing completely different again? You know what I'm saying? Right. Why is he, you know? So that was, that was, you know, that was puzzling. But I think that, um, you know, like I said, it's, I think that he got in a little over his head because he wasn't street savvy I think that you know he just had a lot of inner conflict going on you know I just think there was a lot of inner conflict that's that's all I have on Tupac you cool I really appreciate you but no um no groove theory. good dude though because you know everybody's a, a Tupac fan you know I'm I'm a fan of Pac's work and and he was a person you know I'm, I'm, a, I'm a gracious dude and you know when I when I had my little thing in London with all of them dudes, the dude definitely stepped up. Right. You know, yeah. I've I've definitely heard repeatedly that he definitely loved his people. 
yeah. he was on some black shit. One thousand percent. Yep. Right. 